The following is a presentation of VBR. Welcome, and thank you for joining us in our study of God's Holy Word. Welcome back to our study of 1 Timothy. We are now ready to begin 1 Timothy chapter 4. At the end of chapter 3, in the last segment, Paul spent a moment just enumerating six bedrock truths which all Christians accept and affirm. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. At the beginning of the fourth chapter, Paul directs our attention to a time when truth will be rejected and lies accepted. So let's pick up in verse 1. <clears throat> now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. <clears throat> Paul begins by saying, the Spirit expressly says. That's an interesting statement. The New American Standard renders that explicitly, the NIV clearly. In other words, what Paul is saying to Timothy is, this, the following truth I'm about to reveal to you was not revealed to me in figurative or symbolic language by the Spirit. It was not revealed to me in a vision whose meaning uh, required meditation in order to discern. Recall in Acts chapter 10, after Peter had seen the vision where something like a great sheet was let down from heaven and in it were all manner of four-footed beasts and he was told to rise, kill and eat. He was told three times that he should not call anything that God had cleansed common or unclean. But it says in Acts chapter 10, verse 17, that he was contemplating and wondering what that vision meant. The Lord intended for him to do some thinking and piecing a puzzle together. Paul is saying, the Lord did not reveal the following truth to me in that way, but the Spirit stated it expressly. And here's what he stated. He said that in latter times, times later than this, how far along is not specified, some will depart from the faith. Now, people were departing from the faith in the first century. They were departing from the faith in Ephesus. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19 said that Hymenaeus and Alexander, their faith had suffered shipwreck. Chapter 6, verse 10 said that some had strayed from the faith. Chapter 6, verse 21 says that some had strayed concerning, from the, concerning the faith. This is mentioned in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 18, 2 Timothy 3, verse 8. Paul even ends 2 Timothy by saying, I've kept the faith, implying that others had not. But Paul is not speaking here of the same sort of thing that was transpiring in the first century. For the Spirit to have mentioned this specifically, it must be something different. It was something future, and it was something unique. I believe Paul writes about this very same departure from the faith in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, where he told the Thessalonians the following, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day, that is the day of the Lord, will not come until the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Falling away. That's the same thing Paul's discussing there as he is here with the expression departing from the faith. What is a falling away? Well, it is a departing from the faith, but the word that Paul uses there in 2 Thessalonians 2.3 is apostasia. It's the word from which we get apostasy. And it means a rebellion, an abandonment, a breach of faith. It appears only one other time in the New Testament. That's Acts chapter 21, verse 21, where when Paul had returned to Jerusalem, the Jerusalem elders told him that the Jewish brethren here in Jerusalem are being told that you're talking to the Jews out in the Gentile world and you're telling them that they ought to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children nor walk according to the customs. To forsake is to fall away. 
to forsake is to abandon, and to abandon is to depart from. So these are speaking of one in the same thing. Paul spoke here in 1 Timothy and in 2 Thessalonians of a future falling away, of a future departure from the faith. It's not within the purview of our study of 1 Timothy to go into this in great detail, but a few remarks do seem to be in order. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul said that the ultimate result of this future falling away, or at least the focal point of it, would be a man. He calls him the man of sin and the son of perdition, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3. A few verses later in verse 8, he calls him the lawless one. He says of this man in verse 4 of 2 Thessalonians 2 that he opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. In other words, this man who would be a part of this falling away would assume divine prerogatives. He would act as if he were God. He would assume this authority in the temple of God. That is to say, he would claim to have divine authority in the Lord's church, which is called the temple of God. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17, Ephesians 2, 21. Daniel saw a vision about this very same man in the seventh chapter of his book. There, this man was symbolized by a little horn. A horn is an authority. It is a power. This horn had human qualities. It had eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. And that horn was twice called a he, Daniel 7, 24 and verse 25. John the Apostle spoke of this man. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, he said to the brethren, you have heard, and perhaps they'd heard it from Paul, you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. We know this Antichrist is the same as the man of sin in 2 Thessalonians 2 because the same thing is said about each of them. In 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 7, Paul said that the mystery of lawlessness, which would bring about this lawless one, was already at work. It was already at work in the first century. And in 1 John 4, 3, John says the same thing of the Antichrist. The spirit of the Antichrist, said John, is now already in the world. This coming man of sin, connected with this future departure from the faith, this future apostasy, had roots in the first century. Who is this man? And what is this falling away that he was associated with? This man, I believe, is the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church. Whichever man has fulfilled that office down through the centuries. There's a lot we could say about this, but... Again, it's not within the confines of our study. I'll just mention a few things. The Pope meets the qualifications of the Antichrist. The prefix anti, anti in the Greek meant against Christ, but it also meant to stand in as a substitute for Christ. And what has the Pope done for well over a thousand years? He has claimed to be the vicar of Christ. In essence, Christ here on earth. The Pope claims to possess the authority of God in the Lord's church. Repeatedly, down through the centuries, the popes have claimed to hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. Pope Leo XIII made that claim in those very words. Speaking of the office of papacy, using the royal we, he said, we hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. The Pope claims the power to forgive sins. And who can forgive sins but God alone? Mark chapter 2, verse 7, he claims infallibility. He permits his followers to refer to him as Holy Father. The expression Holy Father appears only one time in the Bible. It's in John chapter 17, verse 11, where Jesus is praying to God, and Jesus called God Holy Father. Again, there's so much more that we could say. But this coming man of sin, this son of perdition, this lawless one, this coming Antichrist, is fulfilled in the office of the Pope. And in conjunction with the rise of the Pope came an apostate religious system and doctrines that are in direct opposition to the faith once delivered to the saints, as the following verses bear out. Before we get to that, though, do notice what he says here at the end of verse 1. 
He said that when this falling away comes, it will be because people will have given heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. They are going to adopt doctrines that originate not with the Spirit of God, but with the spirits under Satan's sway, the demons. They're going to teach demonic doctrines. The demons are very interested in harming humanity. Throughout Scripture, we see examples where demon possession occurred and the demons would bring horrible things upon people, cause them to not be able to speak, not be able to hear, causing them to throw themselves into the fire. Paul talked about how he had a messenger, literally an angel of Satan that was buffeting him, that caught, brought about his infirmity. Not that he was demon-possessed, of course, but apparently God had allowed one of Satan's servants to afflict him in this way. And... That servant wanted to do that, but it brought about good. The demons want to harm us, and they want to harm us no more than in the spiritual realm. This future falling away, Paul said, would be prompted by demonic doctrines. And those who propagated these doctrines, he says in verse 2, would be speaking lies in hypocrisy. These doctrines of demons would be propagated, says the new NAS, by means of the hypocrisy of liars. The ESV says, through the insincerity of liars. NIV reads, such teaching comes through hypocritical, such teachings, pardon me, come through hypocritical liars. The teachers of these doctrines of demons, Paul said, will be hypocrites. They will put on a show of godliness. They'll have a form of godliness, 2 Timothy 3, verse 5, but they'll deny the power thereof. There won't really be a changed life. They will be speaking falsehoods, and they will know it. They will have completely abandoned a good conscience, which we've talked about already in our study of 1 Timothy. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone who's ever taught the doctrines that we're going to be looking at here in just a moment is insincere, by no means. But apparently those who began this falling away, and certainly some down through the centuries, have been of this sort. What allows a person to teach lies on spiritual things knowingly? How could a person do such a thing? Well, Paul tells us here in verse 2, these people will have their conscience seared with a hot iron. The entire expression seared with a hot iron is a translation of a single Greek word, kauteriadzo. It's the word from which we get cauterize. The word could just be translated branded. Multiple Greek sources mention this. And of course, when an animal or a slave in the first century was branded, it would sear the flesh in such a way that in that spot, they would lose sensitivity. When flesh is cauterized, it no longer experiences sensation. And that's the idea here. Paul says these people have gone beyond the point where their conscience bothers them anymore. Ephesians 4.19, Paul spoke of the Gentiles who were past feeling because they'd given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness and greediness. This may not be true of all false teachers. I don't think it is true of all false teachers. But it's certainly true of some. They're past the point where they care. They're past the point where they feel anymore. Life has become about satisfying them. People are a tool to be used for their own benefit rather than to be served. And the ones who would propagate these teachings and bring about this great falling away would be of this sort. What are some of these doctrines of demons? Well, in verse 3, Paul says they will forbid to marry and they will command to abstain from foods. And here we begin to get additional evidence here in 1 Timothy connecting this with the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church continues until this day, in 28, not 2019 now, we're in early 2019, it continues to require celibacy of the majority of its priests. And it has done so for centuries. I was talking with a Catholic man several years ago, a really likable man, an extremely intelligent man, and a very devout man. We were talking about uh, my work, and I was sharing with him how it is a challenge to balance my work, my responsibilities before God with respect to being an evangelist with my responsibilities of being a husband and a father. 
And he responded by saying, well, that's why we in the Catholic Church give those responsibilities to men who are not married. And you can see the reasoning. You can see why someone would think that was beneficial. But the Catholic Church has gone beyond saying it's beneficial to requiring it. No less of bishops whom the Bible says are to be the husbands of one wife. Albert Barnes in his commentary on 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 3 has this to say, quote, The tenth article of the decree of the Council of Trent, a Catholic council, in relation to marriage will show the general view of the papacy on that subject. Here's what the Council of Trent said, quote, Whosoever shall say that the married state is to be preferred to a state of virginity or celibacy, and that it is not better and more blessed to remain in virginity or celibacy than to be joined in marriage, let him be accursed. Let him be damned. This clearly is not in harmony with the sentiments of Scripture, but it has been a long-standing doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church, as has been the teaching that you should abstain from foods. Monks and nuns are sometimes required to abstain from meat. Every year, members of the Roman Catholic Church, 14 and older, are required to abstain from meat on Ash Wednesday and on all the Fridays of Lent. In fact, it wasn't until Vatican II, which took place between 1962 and 1965, that the rule for Roman Catholics changed. Until that time, all members of the Roman Catholic Church were to abstain from eating meat on all Fridays. Uh, humorously, that's actually what prompted a Cincinnati McDonald's to introduce the filet fish sandwich. Their hamburger sales dropped so significantly on Fridays they needed to produce a new form of income, and so they introduced the filet fish and sales picked right back up again. But the great number of Catholics in our country prompted the need for them to make that change. And actually, according to Catholic law, even today, abstinence from meat on Fridays is still required unless some other good work or sacrifice is substituted in its place. Now, I don't say these things to disparage those who practice this. There are many people who, in total good faith and sincerity, are practicing these things. But the Scripture is telling us in no uncertain terms, these doctrines are not from God, and they were part of and continue to be part of a great falling away from the true faith of Christ. It is interesting to note that these doctrines have not just been uh, taught by the Roman Catholic Church. In fact, they were already being taught in the second century before we have any record of the Catholic Church requiring uh, celibacy. It may be that the Roman Catholic Church actually adopted and adapted these doctrines from others. For example, Irenaeus in the second century, in his work Against Heresies, he wrote this somewhere between 175 and 185 AD, he's talking about Gnostic teachers. Gnostic teachers were a problem in Ephesus, as we've mentioned already in previous um, segments of our study. He mentioned a group of Gnostics called the Encratites, and he said they preached against marriage. Some of those reckoned among the Encratites had also introduced abstinence from animal food. So in the second century, these doctrines were already starting to get into the minds and hearts of people. Just a few sentences later, Irenaeus writes about a, a Gnostic teacher, teacher named Tatian, T-A-T-I-A-N, and how this man declared that marriage was nothing else than corruption and fornication. So... Again, these doctrines were not first promulgated and promoted by the Roman Catholic Church, although that religious system has certainly been the one to make them famous. And I do think that is the falling away that Paul is talking about in verse 1, that the Spirit told him about. Now, the reason this teaching that not eating certain foods is not good is stated in verse 4. Every creature of God is good. That is, every creature, that, everything that God has created for food, as he states in verse 3, foods which God created, these things are good. Well, now, good in what sense? Good in the Genesis chapter 1 verse sense, where after each day God saw that it was good, and at the end of the chapter God saw that it was very good? Probably not, since Romans 8.20 tells us after the fall of man, the creation was subjected to futility. It's not good in the same sense that it was before sin. This could have reference to good versus evil, 
in response to the Gnostic teaching that material things were inherently evil, the Gnostics taught that this world should never have been created. It was created by an imperfect being, as we discussed in our study of chapter 1. And so Paul could be hinting at that, whereas they want to teach that these material things are evil. They're not evil, they're good. But probably, Paul is simply saying, these things that were created to be eaten, they're good when they're used for the purpose for which they were made. They were made to be enjoyed by those who believe and know the truth. If, says Paul, they are received with thanksgiving. We'll get more to that in verse 5. In verse 5, he said that these, this creation, this food, is sanctified. That is, it's set apart for use, for acceptable use. By number one, the Word of God. Why is it we're able to eat pork now? Why is it we're able to eat catfish now? The Jews couldn't eat those things. Why are we able to eat crab now? Why are we permitted to eat all of these things? Well, because the Word of God has permitted us to do so. In Acts chapter 10, verse 15, when Peter was having that vision on top of Simon the Tanner's house, he heard these words, What God has cleansed you must not call common. Now that, of course, pertained to God now accepting the Gentiles into the kingdom of God, but it was first of all applied to the, the animals he was looking at. These were Some of these things were things, perhaps all of them, that he had been prohibited his entire life and that had been prohibited to Jews for well over a millennium. But now God said these things were acceptable. In Colossians 2, verses 16 and 17, Paul said, Let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. These things are no longer disallowed. Don't let anyone convince you that it's not appropriate to eat or drink certain things. In moderation, these things are acceptable. The law was only a shadow. We're now in the covenant of Christ. And in Colossians 2, verses 20 through 22, Paul hints at this same thing. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourself to regulations? What regulations, Paul? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using, according to the commandments and doctrines of men. God has created many things for our enjoyment to eat, and these things are perfectly acceptable because God has said they are, and furthermore, they are set apart for our use by prayer. They're good if they're received with thanksgiving. That's what he said in verse 4. Jesus gave thanks before he ate. When he fed the 5,000 in John chapter 6, verse 11, we read, And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples. When he fed the 4,000 in Matthew chapter 15, verse 36, we read, And he took the seven loaves and the fish and gave thanks, broke them, and gave them to his disciples. He even instituted a prayer before the Lord's table though this is a special case, but still, when there was eating involved, there was prayer involved. Paul gave thanks before eating. In Acts chapter 27, verse 35, just before they ran the ship aground on the island of Malta, we read, And when he had said these things, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. This is the pattern in Scripture. God has built in to the way he wants us to live our lives. Times where we'll be sure to pray, hopefully we're praying much more, praying without ceasing, but times which we'll be sure to pray, sure to be thanking Him, because He wants us thanking Him before we eat a meal. That doesn't mean it has to be a formal bow your head or fold your hands type of prayer, only that time does need to be taken to thank God for His provision. In the next segment, we'll pick up in verse 6.